Welcome to The Long Road. My name is Chris Roberts, your host. Before I get to uh, our two guests today, I'm um, <clears throat> going to say a few little words, and it's going to be appropriate because part of the show is going to be in, in the life of, of an athlete and some of the problems that can also happen to be with athletics. It's got some good, it's got some bad. Uh, as an athlete myself, I had s sustained a couple of um, <clears throat> serious head injuries, and in the Marine Corps, I suffered a couple more serious. With, so I suffer from traumatic brain injuries, and some days it gets really frustrated because I don't speak very well, and I have to pause to think, and, and it's one of those, you've got to be able to chill, you've got to relax and not feel guilty or, or bad at yourself or saying, I'm stupid, I can't get something done today. But that was a result of injuries, and we still have athletes, as we'll talk about later, who have the same problem as a result of drug use and alcohol abuse. And so as we get ready to go into the show, our two guests. Kelly Steiner from Anadnock Voices. And Scott Letchery from Franklin Pierce University. I'm a senior. And we met earlier this year out at the alumni field. Yes, we did. I was intern with the Keene Swamp Bats this summer. And I'm going to be a senior going into Franklin Pierce University this fall and I'm the president of the Sports and Recreation Management Club. And so what do you think about the Swamp Bats this year? They, they did great. <laughs> Won the championship this year. Um, took them, they swept the final series to beat um, the Muskrats, the Laconia Muskrats. So um, it, was a, it was a great season. It was fun to be part of too. And you have played an active role in the program with the Swamp Bats. And Let's talk about some of the other community involvements that your organization and the Swamp Bats did. Well, the Swamp Bats were had actually two players plus their announcer. So they had um, Taylor uh, Williams and Dave Mahoney and um, Alex Birch, and then Scott was very active as an intern in actually going out to summer camps in the schools at this summer and speaking to the young people. Um, that were attending those camps about drug use, um, their diets, uh, sleep, their academics, and the importance um, of all those things and avoiding the bad parts of those things but doing the things you need to do such as sleeping or you're going to school um, to be able to achieve your goals and your dreams and how that had played an important role in their life as um, baseball players and achieving their dreams around that. And one of the questions that was um, on the Swamp Bats when I took my grandson to the Swamp Bats, which Swamp Bat player had been drafted in the Major League Draft? And we looked it up. But one of the things I, I found out, that each year about 1,500 players get drafted, for either from high school or different college levels. But only about 20 to 25 of them get to make it to the Major Leagues. And so I'm looking, so on some... And in the four years, that 6,000 kids get drafted by major league teams. And you may be talking about 100 and 125 kids that will be, be able to make the major leagues. And that's not even being superstars. That's not being on top-notch colleges. And sometimes the kids, sometimes the parents tend to look the other way when performance and hand drugs or whatever. They think, my kid is going to be, they've got that potential, they're going to do it. So it's all worth it. What do you say to that? I say that it's definitely not worth it. They, they need to just go at it the way, work hard, a lot of practice is what makes them be good at the game. And I know this year for the Swamp Bats, they had a great coach in Marty Testo. And he, he helped them pretty much show them the way to be and not to be somebody who is going to go out doing those type of things. They need to work hard, but they can also have fun while working hard, too. And <clears throat> because one of, was it this short, blonde-headed kid from Washington? A tailor. <laughs> and when I talked to him, and he goes, yeah, my mom, my dad, they're my idols, but they kept telling me to enjoy myself, have fun. And it's kind of like if I'm enjoying myself having fun, I don't need drugs, I don't need alcohol. I think um, Taylor and Dave both had a pretty strong message around um, there's, there, there is stress attached to um, being, having a competitive edge in sports. 
but that competitive edge for them was very much around their natural ability. And they had a lot of parental support, both of them, around that and really utilizing that to get themselves ahead. And I think that's the important message here is that, you know, we're each born with unique skills and, um, you know, if you can just have great coaches who are helping you enhance those skills and parents who support you in the game and, and don't make it so stressful that it's not fun. Uh, that was very much the message this summer from uh, the, the players that we had from the Swamp Bats. And we're seeing it even more and more in sports in general, that when athletes um, are really looking at their performance level, that, you know, non-use of substances plays a significant role in that because when a, an athlete uses um, alcohol, let's say, it actually affects their performance for four days following the time they've actually consumed that. No matter how much they've consumed, it affects their muscles, it affects their thinking, their response time, just numerous areas. So one of the projects that we're working on right now with Franklin Pierce and the Athletic Club will be to bring in an organization called the American Athletic Institute into the Monadnock region to work with high school um, players, coaches, parents um, and communities around what are our policies, how are we working with our athletes to promote their wellness, and to also um, make sure that people aren't using substances to enhance that performance because ultimately it has a negative effect rather than a positive effect. I was reading a book and the lady who wrote the book was talking about a kid is six, seven, eight years old and the best athlete around or the best gymnast or the best p pianist and they think they're ready to go they're going to be number one and they keep pushing the kid pushing the kid saying don't do anything else just be on this narrow focus and then i took that back when i came to St king state college in 1972 a long time ago um, bob taff was the the coach and king state was an NA naia school he wanted to be competitive so he recruited a whole bunch of people. Except for myself, every single person was a state champ or a New England champ. But in, within the year, we lost about half of them. Some of them were drinking heavy, they were taking drugs. It was the first time that they couldn't be number one. Here it was, you had seven or eight number ones on a team, and you figured they'd be really competitive, but they were frustrated and they turn to drugs and they turn to alcohol. And so I guess that's one of the things that you, you're trying to prevent. Yeah, at Franklin Pierce University, what, what we want to try to do is get our, my club that I'm the president with, where I'm the president of the Sports and Recreation uh, Management Club. And we want to get our club together and work together with Mananoc Voices and the Life of, of an Athlete program. And we want to get some athletes and even some of us out and help mentoring people around the whole community. Um, one of our big things is that we, along with trying to get us more experience in the field, is we want to give back to the community. And that's the big thing that Franklin Pierce is all about, is giving back to the community. And we want to help extend that and help have the athletes give them a chance to mentor people and also give us a chance to, to learn from that. and. Do as, do as much as we can to the community as possible. And as I was looking, research shows more and more, while kids may idolize David Ortiz or, or Jeter, it's the person, the coach, the big brother, the big sister that they get to see every yeah. day. It's not a TV, it's a real person, and that real person can have such a positive effect on that young child's life. Yeah, we're hoping to have that kind of communication and that kind of commitment with our, the people that we're going to hopefully work with this year. And we, we want to have that bond form between the mentor people that we have and the communities that we go out. And that, that's, by the end of the year, that's our main goal is to get some, some sort of bond together that these kids will remember for the rest of their lives. Kind of the pay it forward one. You help, yeah. you help these kids. These kids don't get in trouble. They don't get on drugs or whatever. And people tend to, that peer pressure, you can have peer pressure to be on drugs, but you can be peer pressure not to be on drugs. 
And, and it's interesting because actually there's a higher rate of young people that do not use substances. And you want to increase that number of people. And we also want to get to the ones that are beginning to head down that path because um, as these young people, these college students in particular, are mentoring them, it's so important uh, in their future because it establishes a value that they have in the future. And, uh, you know, we want young people, um, particularly females, I was just reading the statistics, and um, the female use of substances is on the increase, um, particularly alcohol, um, when it comes to binge drinking and prescription drugs. So we're seeing an increasing trend. They've actually surpassed in our region the males on consumption um, of those substances. So we want to get to those folks. And, you know, uh, the statistics show that in rural areas, 65 to 80 percent of young people participate in sports in, in high school. What better way to communicate with them and build a relationship and establish good values around their use of substances than at the high school with college students mentoring them and um, you know people having good education and understanding of what the issues are when it comes to athletics and your your performance and how to, uh, drugs can affect that. When you talk about the participation in sports, I drove drove around the country this summer and I went to a lot of small towns and. I think I don't think people really understand how important sports and organized sports are. One town, state champs, 1951, and every single community that had had a state champ team, whatever level, that's right there as you're re going into town. It doesn't matter if it's 20 or 30 years ago. They take really a lot of great pride in their accomplishments. And, and so, yeah, you're right, if you can hit them where it's important to me would be you can't be part of us if you're doing this bad stuff. Right. And Life of an Athlete is a very interesting program. It's actually a proven program that's been adapted in all of New York State, all of New Mexico. It's going Wisconsin-wide, Michigan-wide. We currently have six regions here in the state of New Hampshire that are all working on bringing this um, in. And these are former Olympians and professional athletes who have realized how this affects athletic performance and they come out and they work with people in the communities. So we'll have them to coming out to work with our athletic directors and our coaches and our parents and our kids um, here in the Monadnock region. Uh, by next year we're beginning to lay the foundation for this and the hope is that um, as we do that people are engaged in really setting good policy in the schools around this but also more importantly that we get parents out with their young people and educating them because we know everybody knows it's a proven fact that parents have the most significant role in a young person's life so we want to make sure we get to them as well it's not just getting to the the athlete it's, it's actually getting um, to the parents. So one of the first sessions that we'll do with them hopefully in the fall is something we're hoping the schools will ultimately mandate that all parents have to attend. Just like um, you know, in Massachusetts now, parents have to attend with their athlete a concussion training. Um, we'd like to see uh, drugs and alcohol raised to that same level of awareness and education that people understand how it plays into athletics and performance. Oh, excuse me, the long-term effect. Before we go talk about girls, especially female athletes and, and, and drugs, when we talked about New Mexico. If you say New Mexico, there's one of the things. New Mexico is right there on the front lines. Yeah. New Mexico, from old Governor Richards, he lays it, Richardson, he lays it right there on the line. And I remember about three years ago, I was going through New Mexico, and there's a big boat, but it's, it's a girl, it's about 12, 13 years old. She has a, a backpack, and it's a little bunny on the back. And in big, bold letters, it says, get a life before you create a life. Mm. And it was kind of like, wow, that's profound. And it's, <laughs> and, it's, and it's like a girl, and it says, get a life before you create a life. And it seems to have a really positive effect and so if New, New Mexico is, understands it, it has to be, it has to be a good pro program. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, New Mexico has created a whole online um, web training that's attached to this for all athletic directors um, across the state and for um, coaches. 
to access, and they're actually making that available for a fairly minimal cost to other states. So we're working on seeing if we can bring that into the state of New Hampshire and adapt it to some of the information we have here in New Hampshire. The, um, when, you, when you're talking about, about girls, and I guess females, girls or uh, uh, young ladies, I got granddaughters and daughters, but it's like <laughs> you look, is when you go, you know, anecdotally, j just where I live in, in Keene, by a number of the stores between Cumberland Farms and some of the other stores, Panucci's, over the years, I've been living here about 10 years now, the number of female college students that are drinking is going up. As the years go by, five years ago, you never saw a, a girl or a female college student bringing a 12-pack or a 24-pack. Now you may see three or four of them, and they each have a 24-pack going towards the, <coughs> the bong place. Um, <coughs> what is it? Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday, going down towards Walmart, and right next to the bike place, there was a bunch of girls out there. They were just drinking, and they were playing the bong game. And I'm looking at them, I'm saying, none of them are over 21 because the freshmen were, were coming in. And that is such a, a big change from 10 to 15 years ago. You used to see the, the guys getting drunk, not the, the females. It actually is a significant change. And, uh, you know, from the last 2009-2010 statistics, we're actually seeing that in the data that we've been collecting that there's an increase uh, not only in the consumption and 30-day use of females, but the binge drinking. Um, and their perception of risk now attached to um, using alcohol and prescription drugs in particular is much lower than um, a male's perception of risk attached to that. And in terms of the prescription drugs, we're seeing a higher rate of usage among females. Um, I was sharing with Scott for a couple of reasons um, that they're able to actually show in the documentation. And one of them being that um, young women see it as a um, way to cope with stress and um, problems they may be having at home, um, and more so than a male does. Um, so they see it as a coping mechanism, particularly prescription drugs. Uh, Over-the-counter drugs um, are a higher rate of usage among females in the high school level, prescription drugs at the college level. The other thing with the college level is we're seeing the um, prescription drugs because of the um, students feel like it makes them focus better, they can stay up longer, and believe it or not, we actually have um, documentation showing they like to do it in combination with alcohol because it allows them to drink more um, when they're doing the prescription drugs. Um, they can drink longer, hang with people longer, and drink more. Um, and obviously that's of concern because at the same time we're seeing all of that, the poisoning rate is um, four times what it, it used to be two years ago um, with uh, emergency room uh, entries and uh, for overdose. Um, we're also seeing a higher rate of um, suicide and um, folks dropping out of school and not being able to keep up academically. So they may think that it's helping them focus, but actually um, what it is is a red flag that they're at risk for uh, higher usage and potentially not making it through school. And it, it does, when you go in there and you say the perception problem is how can a, a female, again, i got three daughters, think that they're at m less risk than a male? If I binge drink, I did a couple of times and I passed out and the guys thought it was cool, but I didn't come home with an STD. I didn't come home pregnant. But if, you're, if you have a daughter and she goes and binge drinks and she passes out at a fraternity or a strange place, you may not want to look at some of the consequences. There are some extremely high risks that these young ladies, they may not, assume, not realize they're taking, but if you binge drink, you pass out, you don't know what's happening until you come out of that drunken stupor. That, that's definitely one of the risks associated with this, um, is it could make you a victim, um, absolutely, um, subject to crime in numerous ways, um, physical violence. Um, we, you know, you can see it all in the crime statistics. And, uh, you know, the other thing is that for, there's health consequences attached to this, uh, whether it's their future abilities to have a family, 
Um, there's just numerous things that, that it can affect for both males and females. You know, we're seeing an increased rate of cancers associated with um, use of this. Uh, the perception of risk around marijuana is extremely low. When you talk with parents, for example, they um, would rather see their kids smoking pot than drinking or um, smoking cigarettes. And uh, the highest rate of perception of risk is actually attached to cigarettes, believe it or not. Not alcohol, not marijuana, not prescription drugs, but they, those substances are surpassing now the use of um, tobacco. The, we'll bring back to that later. But when we're what I've been seeing more and more is there's been more female, especially on the professional level, female athletes who are getting busted for drug use. And as you look more and more, women always wanted to be equal to men but i think there's certain areas women really don't want to be as equal to men yeah well my take is that for yeah. sports i think women want to have that same equal ability and be able to play as many sports as the men do but i i think what the thing is is just to make it they need to be responsible both men and women about how they how they play and how how, how they want to achieve their goals pretty much they 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 don't want to go out there and be just like um <coughs> just have a lot of problems and stuff by getting having using drugs doing all that i mean it's it is out there definitely uh, but i think they do have the same ideas as the men and they they want to have fun play the sport and also try to get as far as they can with the sport too and um when you <coughs> have the mentoring programs are you going to have female athletes in and other females involved in the program yes we're uh, that's what i'm hoping <coughs> to have i'm hoping to have a little bit split of each and what we're hoping to do is have some of them um probably their off season they'll do the mentoring just because their season is just so jam-packed to begin with and we're gonna ha have try to get some both women and men and that way when they go out to the different communities and the schools around our communities it shows the kids that it's just not one gender it's both the genders that is really important to get the message to yeah because since title nine was enacted there's millions of girls and young ladies who are playing sports who had never had the opportunity in the past yeah, that, that's definitely true, and it's it's showing to be more like that as the year years go on too. Um, I know for Franklin Pierce, they they've they've done a lot in the past couple of years too, and our basketball team in the past couple of years, the women's team has been to the national championships. The so the team's been pretty good. Exactly that too. So it's it shows that both it doesn't matter what gender, it, the same story of the life to an athlete what we're trying to do with the program applies to both Our, um, in the mentor program is there going to be a possibility that you're going to bring in some of the people who were top-notch athletes but didn't make it to the pros but highly successful in the community to go and help show some of the kids there's more than just hoping to be the next Derek Jeter there's still the rest of your life Oh, we're we're trying to see. We're we're still trying to work out who's gonna end up um, gonna be the people that are gonna be mentoring. But we we haven't. We we might have do that. But I think we might end up just focusing on the actual student athletes. And if there's a few times that we can get some of the recent athletes that have made it on, because I know this past few years we've had people drafted from our school. If we could have them come back, and th that would also be great too. But. Right now, we're just trying to focus on the athletes that we have right now and trying to have them go out and send their message and their story out to the, peop the community. So what are some of the communities that you hope to work with? Uh, we hope to work with uh, um, Peterborough, uh, Jaffrey Ranch area, and then also extend to the New Ipswich area too, the Greenville, that place. And this is really getting important because as you're getting more education cut funding cut back from the state and the federal level when you start to go and you're on the school board and saying which needs to go and
to this for a lot of parents would say, wait a minute, I want this. This is not really important. I can take care of Johnny and Susie myself. And if Billy has problem, that's Billy's parents' fault, not the taxpayer's fault. I, th I think you could have a response by, like that, but I think we go back again to that athletics play an important role in a young person's life in school, and we see so many kids participating in that. And in response to your question about, you know, for the ones that don't make it to the pros, because the percentage of people don't, don't make it to, to the, the pros. pros. You know, every parent, every kid dreams of making it to the pros, but you have a small percentage chance that you're going to make it there. But that, you know, this is about um, ha giving yourself that competitive edge and knowing what you put in your body can affect that performance that you're going to put out there. And that it'll affect your life decisions for the rest of your life. Because, you know, the, being an athlete at, you know, whether it's a high school or a college level, even at the peewee level, you develop a whole system of values and morals um, attached to your life. And, you know, if you're willing to put yourself at risk uh, at those younger ages, you're likely to become more likely to become alcoholic. You're more likely to become a substance abuser, more likely to be addicted and eventually need treatment. Um, if you start at a young age with that kind of value system. So what we want to do is get to the people and the young people before they're developing um, into that. And, you know, we're all aware that sports has a lot of particularly drinking attached to it. Um, you look at the Super Bowl, March Madness, um, you know, what are the advertisements that you're seeing? It's all related to, um, you know, it's time to party. And, uh, you know, this is reversing that message a little bit because it's not about that. It's about achieving your dreams, achieving your goals. It worked with chewing tobacco. Chewing tobacco <laughs> is almost non-existent in, in pro sports now. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> And when I'm looking at the mentor program and I look at good peewee coaches or little league coaches, and I guess some people will take it wrong, but one of the things that seems good ones, they teach you it's all right to lose as long as you learn from losing, where you have some other coaches that win at all costs where losing is unacceptable, and if you lose, it's your fault that you're not working hard enough. And so... When you're talking about suicide and the pressure, well, if it's not my fault it's, and I'm not working hard enough, I'm saying, wait a minute, I'm working harder and harder. Then I have to go and look for something, whether it's a drug or, like you say, hey, you got all these football players, they're in the pros and they're swinging down three or four, so what's the problem? Right. You know, it was so much fun watching the World um, Little, Little League, League series. Uh, and listening to those young kids talking about what was the most important part of their experience being in this World Series. You didn't hear anything about, you know, hitting the home run or anything. You heard these kids talking about it was about meeting the other kids. It was about having the chance to hang out with people and have a good time and have fun. Um, and that's what it's about, you know, no matter what age you are. And even, I think, at some level in the pros, I, you know, I realize they get paid for it. But if you talk to a lot of the pro athletes, that's what they care about, is that they enjoy and love the game. And you can see the difference between an athlete who loves the game and an athlete who's just doing it for the fame. Yes, absolutely. I definitely agree with that. It, you have to have fun at what you're doing. If you don't, then... I, I believe you shouldn't be doing it. And you, and for the kids that are growing up thinking that they have to win every single game when they're that young, the, the most important thing that they should be doing is learning and not necessarily winning. Yeah, a win here and there is nice, and it's a nice yeah. confident, confidence booster. But I think the most important thing is the lessons they learn when they're young. And I, that will help them make them a better person and a better player and just a better overall person overall being for their future. <coughs> when you're talking about all the values that kids make learn from playing athletics, in the Marine Corps officers program, mostly all the officers candidates are athletes and the great majority of them were team captains. Because the Marine Corps is saying teamwork, intelligence, hard work, preparation, you learn all those from being an athlete and they just have a, 
such a halo effect on, on the rest of your life, and like you're talking about, if you try to get around it by using drugs, then you don't learn any of those things that are going to help you for the rest of your life. No, and, and like I said before, it actually puts you at greater risk um, because, you know, you're more likely to take other risks. In your, if you're willing to do substances, you're more likely to take other risks in your life, whether, it's wear, whether you wear a seatbelt or not, wear a bike helmet or not, uh, whatever it may be, you know, there's definitely uh, risks associated with your behavior. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure we get back to the swamp bats yeah. and their winning <laughs> season because... Um, it was such a great moment working with these two players and the announcer through the last two weeks in particular of the season because they moved from first place to third place to second place back to first. They, they bounced all around. The top four teams in there were, you know, constantly shifting position. And, you know, they held true to what they believed, which was their dream and their goal and their their value system. And they they played hard. They went out there and played hard and um, they worked hard at it and, you know, they ended up winning. Uh, and it wasn't about, well, we, we lost this game today, so we're going to go out and party tonight because we're going to go drown our sorrows. Um, it wasn't like that. They wanted to go into the next game performing the best they could. And, and they had a great season. I mean, it was fun to watch for the fans. <laughs> One of the things I would have to say about the, the Swamp Bats over the, is the, whether they had a good team or a bad team was the character of the players. Who, who, I don't know how, how they sit down and pick of the thousands of baseball players or around the I don't think they've picked a bad apple in, since they've been, been here. Yeah, I think um, I think I don't know how much picking they actually get to do. I think they inherit some so. of those players, um, but I think you know this year was just a, the team seemed to be a great mix from everything I heard, and I know the players that we worked with just did a super job out there messaging. Great community service, not just a great team for the Keene fans and the area fans, but uh, just good community service with great messaging. And the, those two young men, there wasn't an ounce of arrogance no. in them. Even just, I guess the, the Keene Sentinel and some of the other ones helping you out because they still have the, the photos. Even looking at those, it's kind of like those would parents would be proud to have it as their sons. And they would just when you look at it, they just brought that point across. And I think that's what's so important about mentoring. No, I, I agree with that, too. I know with uh, Taylor, one of the people who mentored here, said that to bring back about the, how the team all went together, they're in the character. They wish that they could all, he said that they wish they could all transfer schools and play on the same <laughs> team all throughout the year. It was just that, <clears throat> that sort of teamwork that, brought all of them together that I haven't, I've never seen for a team before. And having those type of people go out to the community where we, the people around the Keene commu um, community thought that Swamp Bats, they looked up to them as Red Sox players almost in, in that aspect. And to have people go, have two of them go out and go around to the different schools and talk to the kids about the importance of alcohol abuse and um, drug abuse and all of that and how, how much family is such an important uh, aspect to get to where you want to be. Uh, it, I think that it's such a great thing to have teams and have players that are willing to do that and enjoy doing that too. And talking to a f few of the other teams, they're quite jealous of the Swamp Bats and how they seem to work it all together or the, the connection that they have with the community. Yeah, I know for the t different teams that we played against, they, from from what I heard, they, I, I I never really heard of what they did other than than play the game and play it hard. But for the Swamp Bats, it was more than just playing the game on the field, and they they all were in into the community aspect of being a college athlete, and they did a wonderful job with that too. And it, it was kind of. Well, like being um, <clears throat> Quain or Frisee. It was almost like every single one of those young men felt there was a privilege to play in front of the, the home the fans, and they didn't want to let the fans down. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with that too. And with the last game of the 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 season, they if they won, One. they were in first place. <coughs> and if they lost, they were in third place. And having the fans, that I believe that was one of our biggest turnouts of the whole year was that night. And having the fans behind them, they, they didn't want to ha- send them home with a loss and having them in third place, kind of having to work their way to the championship. They, they just wanted to do their work and give the fans a treat for respecting them and being out there every day throughout the whole summer. And when it comes to, to mentoring, that's contagious. You don't, okay... For example, in college, I mean high school students, mom or dad says, I want you to go to Dartmouth. Well, so go to Dartmouth, you need to go down to Guatemala for two weeks. You need to do this, you need to do that. And young kids, they're pretty smart. They know when you're trying to pull something over on them. You don't get that feeling with the Swamp Bats. It, w- it was completely genuine. And when it's genuine, the kids are there, <clears throat> My, my granddaughter, I want to swamp that ball, I want to swamp that ball. And my two grandsons, and when the ball was going over, they were running like crazy to get the ball. And it's right, you're talking, they were like heroes. They were kind of like the Red Sox players. Exactly. They just, it, it was just so contagious. And so, and I think your program is great and you, and you picked the, the right people. We actually didn't pick the people, (laughs) believe it or not. This is what I love about this, because you said, you know, they had carried such an important and positive message. They volunteered. Um, These were players and the announcer that wanted to get out there and talk to these young kids about this, and they volunteered for this, um, for this summer. And, you know, to me, what better message than that? Um, And they created their own message. We did not give them any material. We actually sat down with them and we said, what's your message? And they told us and we said, that's a great <laughs> message. You don't need to do anything else except be you. Now, if you're a college freshman and you're a high school junior, you're pretty close together in age. Yeah, exactly. definitely, definitely. So, you know, I think the um, Swamp Bats will hopefully continue this into next, year, next season with us. Um, but in between, we'll be working with Franklin Pierce on it. Uh, meanwhile, also working with American Athletic Institute and all the area coalitions. You know, we have multiple coalitions here in the Monadnock region who are working with the area high schools to get them involved in uh, this whole strategy of life of an athlete. And uh, that is actually a, an amazing program that's being utilized now in, in both high schools. And we'll also um, be bringing in uh, that organization to work with the college level coaches on coaching for effectiveness. And I'll bring up a, a, a touchy subject. And I think it goes, over the, the past few years, we've had a number of um, high school athletes, and, and I include cheerleaders and other ones, that died way too young. Yes. And, and a bunch of times it's alcohol, it's been alcohol related. And, or they've had too much alcohol and did something stupid they would not have done in a normal, um, took a risk. But, but we as a society, we as a community have said, well, <clears throat> there's, it's, it's too painful, so we're going to go and celebrate everything they did in life, and we tend to totally block out that alcohol or drugs had any involvement whatsoever. And so, and sometimes, yes, maybe 16, 17, did a wonderful life, all this, but we sometimes lose the teaching point of why that life came to an abrupt end. That's very true, and I think sometimes we need to stop and reflect on that because uh, it is costing lives, and uh, whether it's alcohol or prescription drugs um, and injury. And it's not always, you know, sometimes we have athletes that are injured because of this type of thing and can never play again. And, you know, we do need to take that as a learning moment and reflect on it. Reflect on it as a community, as parents, as young people and peers. Um, We need to stop and look at what was the core issue here? Because we'll never change it if we don't do that. I've been on the school board and it's just really painful when when someone comes up Mr. X or 
Mrs. X son or daughter died and how do we memorialize someone and we as p parents and adults are looking at it but mostly the the other students they understand the real cause mm -hmm. and so <clears throat> it kind of um the the song by um is it the perry band if i die young and it's like, if I die young, everything is great. You know, people are going to say all nice things about me. And I'm going, well, that's not really a song that we should have 16, 17-year-old kids singing or, or glorifying it. And so, to me, we should not have any 16, 17, 18-year-old kid, whether it's an athlete or not, dying young because of alcohol abuse or, or, or drug abuse or taking some pills and flying down the highway at 85 miles an hour through a puddle and then call it an accident. I absolutely agree with you and I think we have a lot of work to do with our justice systems, with our, our system of belief um, that's out there, you know, among our communities and, you know, it's something we're working at. It's not an easy road. <laughs> Um, and particularly when it comes to alcohol, because alcohol is a legal substance for adults. And you even look at adult-related accidents, and um, how often do we acknowledge that it may have been due to uh, alcohol or due to um, prescription drug, because that's actually what we're seeing an increased um, rate of now is accidents related to people having other um, illicit substances or prescribed medication um, in them. You know, when you're on a prescription, if you're following doctor's orders, it can be of great medical benefit. Um, when you misuse it, uh, it, you're misusing it, and it has consequences. Maybe we should stop calling them accidents because people like to think accidents is something they had no control over. That's a great point, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was an accident. It wasn't, every time you hear it, it was an accident. It wasn't my fault. It was an accident. We, we learned that from a little kid. Mm. Oh, Mom, I broke your dish. It was an accident. But I couldn't help it. I was driving my um, big wheel around the house. Right. <clears throat> was it, it was preventable, so it's not an accident. Yeah. For every action, there's <clears throat> a reaction. That's what they <clears throat> used to say. So. So as far as the... <clears throat> the mentoring program, if you had to wrap it up, how would you want to, to tell people what's your goal of the mentoring program? I guess our goal for this year is to find some people that we have that will have a great story, be able to reach the kids from all ages and also the adults for the communities around us and just kind of get them to have this, ha have the idea of how important it is to stay on track in your life and not to go party and not to use substances and and stuff like that and what we're hoping as I, I want to get the whole club together and kind of go through the whole the whole process of from the start to the finish of how to do the program and and what we can do to kind of get ourselves out there and market ourselves and make make it a whole thing that we can work off of and at, and at the end, to be able to say at the, we did a great job in w going out there and letting the kids in our community know that this is their story and this is what you can learn off of it. We, we want we want to try to make an impact to the kids to make them a better play person or players in the future for their lives. The, if someone wanted to contact you, how would they contact you? Uh, I guess the best way to contact me would uh, be through my school email, and uh, that would be Lettre, L-E-T-T-R-E-S, at live.franklinpierce.edu. Now, looking at what you're saying is kind of I'm trying to go back to that um, New Mexico mm -hmm. billboard. It's almost kind of like you're only a kid once. Enjoy yeah. life. Don't waste it on drugs. Yes. <clears throat> and it's something like that. Is yeah, we're only a kid once, and pretty soon you're going to graduate from college and you're going to have to do the adult um, things and the requirements and look back and say, well, I blew it. I just drank my last six years, my last two years in high school, and I drank my way through college, and boy, I missed those opportunities to make friends. I missed those opportunities to do things. Yeah, I mean, I've got <coughs> one year left in college, and I've already started thinking that, and 
and then next year I have to go finding a full-time job and I have to make sure I'm gonna I have to I'm on my own way after this year and it's made me look back at the past years and and thankfully I've never been involved in any of that stuff in the past and it it just shows that I, I think I've met everything that I've wanted to do along this way and I just hope I can continue that throughout the years too. And anytime you can help bring people along that way it just makes you feel better as a person. Exactly. And you know this isn't going to be just a one one shot deal that we have going on here. The mentoring project we're trying to build so that we can build relationships in the hopes that we establish the whole life of an athlete program for multiple years to come. Whether it's affecting policy in schools, um, how coaches work with kids and parents, all those kinds of things. It's a long-term project, long-term goal, and uh, you know we hope to make a difference in young people's lives and a difference in parents' lives, honestly, and our communities. Good. <clears throat> yeah, as we were talking about, athletics is, is so important. Athletics is part of your education. It's not an extracurricular activity. People may call it, but athletics is just like arts and music. They should all be part of a well-rounded education. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I definitely agree with that too. I did. I was an athlete ever since probably four or five years old, and I played uh, sports all the way up through my senior year of high school. And it was the stuff that you learn about managing your time and how to be a teammate and how to work together that you have with playing sports that you you really don't get anywhere else. And that that's definitely helped me be who I am today. Definitely. And so. You want to, would you have to wrap up on this part with the program? Uh, well, um, you know, people can look forward to us reaching out to all six high schools in the Monadnock region. Um, the mentoring program will continue up on the eastern side of the mountain um, through Franklin Pierce. We are working with Keene State College as well, um, engaging them in some of this. And uh, I think people can look forward to hearing from uh, things happening in the next year. And uh, hopefully we'll have every, uh, every one of the high schools engaged. And you were talking about parents. What about if parents want to get involved? If parents want to get involved, they should con contact um, either Monadnock Voices, and we will direct them to one of their area coalitions, <coughs> because each, um, each of the portions of the region has a coalition working uh, in it that's actually working to engage the high schools. And uh, we'll direct them. Um, and ad hoc voices can be reached at uh, either 603-313-4248 or at uh, info at monadnockvoices.org. So can you repeat the phone number again? 603-313-4248. And so I want to thank both of you for being here. And I hopefully this should be really successful. Based on what we've seen from the Swamp Bats, you're well on your way to the major leagues. They did a, a quality job. You as your internship, you get it going. Those two young men, I'm really bad with names. That's a stupid head injury thing. But, <clears throat> but they did an outstanding um, job. And I was more than proud to, to be able to interview them. It cost my granddaughter and my um, <laughs> grandsons to say, oh, you, you were the Swamp Bat, you were the Swamp Bat, you were with the team. I go, no, I'm not with the team. I was just, just asking them. And so one, two or six and the other one was nine. So if they, were, if they were watching it and they were excited by it, I think there's a lot of other young kids that were excited by it. Absolutely. And, uh, and we saw <coughs> that from Hinsdale all the way up into um, – you know, the Peterborough side, that kids just love the message, love seeing the players, and uh, they were very, very engaged in this, more so than if I was going in and educating them. And again, thank you for coming here, and thank you for watching our show, and I will see you on the long road.